Hi, welcome everyone. And uh, of course, our esteemed guest today is Josh Bobernick. He is here to discuss with us uh, some uh, rulings, tournament policy, all things related to more technical aspects of the game, uh, I suppose, that uh, is uh, commonly associated with Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself at all? Sure. Um, I'm Josh Bobarnik. Uh, I have been playing Yu-Gi-Oh since Yu-Gi-Oh came out in the States, at least. So I just um, want to quickly say that I apologize for uh, pronouncing your name incorrectly for like months, <laughs> uh, maybe years at this point. So it's it's Bavard. So the emphasis on the A, not the O. My bad. Right. I, no, <laughs> no problem. I, the reason I don't correct people is because I'm just so used to everybody saying it incorrectly. I, I, I hear a different pronunciation every day. So I've given up. <laughs> but right. yeah, I, I've i been playing Yu-Gi-Oh! since it came out in the States. And I... Uh, have been judging actively since the early 2010s, and uh, I've been head judging YCS and higher events since 2017. Have you been the head judge for every American event since 2017? <laughs> no, no. So we, we have a, a pretty solid rotation. Um, we try and give as many people an opportunity as possible, but usually I'll head judge about one a year. Um, and I've head judged the uh, North American World Championship qualifier as well. Um, and been a floor judge at Worlds a couple times. Okay, so you are, you know, extremely well experienced and well versed with tournament policy and all of uh, sort of the the more difficult aspects of the game. Not just like the uh, <laughs> not just the rulings, but you know the more technical things of like how do you uh, enforce a penalty? How do you uh, you know proceed in certain whatever aspects are required that aren't just ruling related. So I wanted to go into like two topics specifically with regards to tournament uh, policy. Um, the one I want to talk about more is more like uh, the general sort of, uh, how should we describe it? Like the actual playing area uh, for, for players. I wanted to ask like, um, what are some things that you think people uh, might misconstrue about how the gameplay should, uh, like for example, the zones and stuff should be set what type of sleaze you can use, um, mats, because I feel like there's a lot of like basic things that way that a lot of players can kind of just get wrong or really sort of, you know, uh, just it's... not have a fully, not be fully clued up on. You know, more often than wrong, it's more that they know it's wrong, but they don't understand why it's wrong. So they feel that it shouldn't be and they just ignore it anyway. Um, zones is a perfect- to your mind specifically for that? Zone, zones and sleeves, the, the two that you listed there are, are perfect examples of that. You know, everyone knows that there's an actual layout for your field. Um, and everyone knows that there's a place for everything. But no one really understands, aside from the five spell and trap zones and the five monster zones, why it matters where your deck is, where your graveyard is, um, where your field spell is, and things like that. And they'll frequently put cards in different locations because to them, it's not a big deal. Right, like I, my cards are there. You can see my cards. You know where they are. I'm not. I'm not putting them under the table. I'm not like manipulating them. I'm just not putting them. You know, vertical. I'm not put. I, a ton of people love to put them horizontal. Or I'm putting my deck above my graveyard. That's um, uh, the, the exact example I was going to give you. Like personally, I find it just more convenient if the grave is under the the deck, so that it's just easier to reach like if you play like a graveyard deck like burning abyss one of the best decks ever made you need to like have easy access to your grave and so it's just sort of easier for if it's just physically closer to you so i completely understand that sentiment um there are a lot of things that i will allow as a judge um and one of them is, you know, if, if you're left-handed, for example, I am okay with swapping the the ends of the fields to opposite yeah. sides. That's a um, really uh, popular one for yeah. at least, well, I wouldn't say popular because there's like four people in the world who are left-handed apparently, but I've been <laughs> in, uh, I've been, <laughs> I've been in duels where um, people uh, on, on my stream will call me out and be like, why is his deck over there? But this is an actual official, I, I don't know if official is the correct word to use, but this is a generally accepted thing among judges that you're allowed to mirror your field if you're left-handed. Yes. Yep. Okay. As long as, as long as there's still a correlation between your five center zones and your opponents and the extra monster zones and we can determine what's lined up with what i'm okay with you mirroring your field left and right 
I am not okay with the graveyard on the bottom because I mm. understand where you're coming from. And I have played graveyard decks. I've played dragon rulers. I've, I, I completely, I played Necroz. I, I like, trust me. I wish that I could say, I agree with you and that the graveyard closer to you is fine. The reason I disagree with that is because you will find how much it slows down the game. If you actually pay attention to it, watch some people who play with the graveyard there and then watch them play the same opponent, but with the graveyard in the correct location. Um, when their opponent needs to see their graveyard, um, nine times out of 10, they will not need to see it as frequently if it's up top because it's easy access. But when it's blocked by view of the deck, you will have some issues where the opponent isn't able to see everything. So just keeping that in plain view is easier. Yeah, okay. I, I, I understand, it makes sense. Um, I wanna ask, is there like a particular like huge pet peeve you personally have as to something that people do with regards to their placement and play area? For me, I hate the field spell in like the field center. Like, someone will just, like, smack their field spell into, like, the middle of the mat. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> so, I that is a really old habit that I'm actually surprised to see it's a lot of players It's from the old rules, right? Up. Yes, right. When there was only one field spell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, so, they they would put the field spell in the middle and a lot of people just was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. And back then, it didn't really matter because there was only one field spell at a time. Um, mm. But now... As you're going to play a tier element mirror, you're both going to have your field spell, and what are you going to do? Stack them on top of each other in the center there? Like, I, I, it does bother me. Just, it's not that hard to put the field spell card in the field spell zone. Um, you want to, like I said, you want to mirror it. You want to put the field spell zone on the right hand side instead of the left hand side. Go right ahead, do that. But I think don't probably put it in the a really important and fair question is, um, what do we do about? what is the official to where what is a card that is removed from play is it banished is it removed from play and also where do you put it there is no set so so banished cards do not have a zone they are just banished they are removed from play um you may put those wherever is comfortable for you as long as they're still in view of your opponent and you don't start like five different banish piles as i've seen plenty of players do without realizing yeah you slowly it. over the course of a game after <laughs> snow, snow has like a pile of like seven here seven there and then there's just like a jenga pile of cards yep <laughs> um as long as it's one pile there's no set place you can put it wherever you want as long as it's on the table and in view of your opponent is there um, somewhere you would recommend as a acceptable place to put it the recommended way and this has really come about a lot in remote duel since you know we're trying to set a standard for where things can be so that they're visible on the camera is next to the e extra monster zone horizontally no ver uh, or horizontally i think right e which yeah uh ho Sideways. horizontally so that it's not it's not confused for the extra monster zone um above the graveyard is a good is a good point um but typically, we, we we recommend next to the extra monster zones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, in terms of sleeves, is there anything that springs to mind when you think of typical mistakes or things that people should abide by more often? So, a lot of people struggle with the double sleeving policy. It's it's still kind of new. Well, double sleeving wasn't allowed for the longest time. Um, and now that it is allowed, a lot of people have a lot of questions about what kind of oversleeves are acceptable. Um, mm. And there's been a whole bunch of uh, product makers that have been kind of jumping on the double sleeve bandwagon and making these oversleeves with design. Um, mm. And I I love some of the designs. Uh, I love, uh, there were some uh, Tanjiro and Nezuko sleeves that came out with the water, um, the water design and the flower petals. Um, and I actually bought both of those. And then I got my water ones and I put them on my deck. Um, and some people will put them on with the design on the back. Some people will put them on the front. And I typically like to put it on the front because if my extra deck monsters can be face up, I want, you know, I want to show the design around the border. I was very disappointed to see that the water ones are not tournament legal while the flower ones are. What does that um, mean, tournament legal? And 
The reason is because the design covers the left and uh, I think top link arrow as well as the attack stat of the monster with kind of the, the, the water stuff. So if any of those designs bleed into covering a stat or attribute um, of Important a printed card, yeah, they're they're not legal for tournament play. So I'll put clear over sleeves on them because it's all about, to me, it's protecting the sleeve more than it is protecting the card that's in the sleeve. The card's already protected by the one sleeve. Now I'm using a, a, a fancy sleeve, so I just want to put some protection on it. But if I'm siding an extra deck card, I'm not doing that because you do have to swap out the card. This uh, was from the exactly sleeve. what I was going to ask you about. Why do extra deck sided cards need different need to have the same sleeves as the main deck every card in the side deck has to match the main deck in sleeves and every card in the extra deck has to match each other in sleeves so you can use different sleeves on your extra deck as long as all 15 are the same but your side deck always has to match your main deck. Uh, white main deck sleeves and like red extra deck sleeves and you side an extra deck monster you can't have your sided extra deck like let's say this matchup i want to side a dweller i would need i can't have 14 white and one red sleeves in my one red sleeve in my side deck i would have to physically swap the sleeve pull out the card and put it in in between games correct right um i can't give you the logic or reason behind that decision um I think I understand it a little bit, but at the same time, I have my own questions about it. Um, but that is what's written in policy, so that's what we have to do. You want to make it so that it's easy to side deck, and if you don't have a policy saying that the side deck has to match the main deck, then you could have someone show up with 15 cards and 15 individual colored sleeves in their side deck. And then when they swap them out with their main deck, they have to swap the sleeves or you get newer players who don't realize that, Hey, they have to swap the sleeves at all. And they just shuffle in 15 randomly colored cards into their main deck. So in the interest of speeding up the side deck process and not having people swap 15 sleeves, every time they go to change cards in and out between the main deck and side deck, it's just easier to say the main deck and side deck have to match, which makes the extra deck kind of the outlier. I guess uh, the final point I want to bring up about the play area for the next uh, section is tokens. I think a lot of players get tokens quite uh, incorrect, would you say? Yes, 100% um, agree. Uh, and there's a lot of confusion with tokens, but there's just as much frustration for the people who do understand the policy. Basically, you you cannot use a Yu-Gi-Oh related card unless it has the word token written on it. So you can and take, that is- hi, so you, you can take any card, Yu-Gi-Oh card, and just write token with a Sharpie across it. Does that allow you to use it as a token? Yeah, I, I, but that's, I mean... That's generally been my understanding is that if you like literally just like have the word token plastered across it, then that's okay. That's the general gist of it, which a lot of people come up and they're like, I don't want to write it out on my card. Can I write that on the sleeve? And we, we end up telling them, no, you have to write it on the card if you want it. The explicit written in policy what meets as a token is that it has to meet the following requirement it has to be able to indicate attack and defense position so it doesn't necessarily have to be a card but whatever it is you're using has to be able to you have to be able to differentiate what is attack position what is defense position non-token cards that are used as tokens this would be your your example with using a Yu-Gi-Oh card they have to have token written on the card itself. That includes, you know, Sharpie. So if, if you want to use your well. Sprite Blue as a token, you're writing token across it with, with Sharpie. If there's a card that's specifically prohibited by tournament policy, such as non-token OCG cards, the best example are the, the Duelist Kingdom cards. Anything Yu-Gi-Oh related like that, whether it's Bandai, whether it's OCG, they cannot be used as a token unless they explicitly have token written on them also. We're trying to make it so that you can't mistake a token as a game element. Next point I wanted to ask uh, is about peripherals of sorts on the, the play area. I summon Apoloza using three materials. I put a dice on my Apoloza, indicating the number three. <laughs> You're gonna put me on the spot. Uh, you want you want my personal opinion and then my judge <laughs> answer, or you just want the judge answer? I'm I'm curious as to both, I guess. All right, I'm gonna start with the correct answer. That is against policy. You cannot really? put a dice. You cannot put a dice on your Appaloosa to uh, signify attack. First off, you cannot use a dice as a counter unless you're using it as an individual counter. So you can't just put a dice, put three, and say that that's that. But I think this Opelousa, is more one of the uh, controversial recent changes. Yes. Like if Opel I have a Master Endymion in my Pendulum scale, you want me to use six individual dices to indicate six spell counters rather than <laughs> the dice face up with the number six. That is right. what the policy document says. Okay. 
Um, um, I can get so into in that a little of, more. So in terms of Appaloosa and stuff, that's not yes. okay? Yes. Okay. So the reason it's not okay with Appaloosa, I wouldn't even allow the three individual dice. And this is the judge answer. I don't have to agree with every policy, but I'm going to always apply it as it's written because that is my job as a judge. Appaloosa is not a card that gains counters. So you cannot put counters on a card that doesn't gain counters. Mm -hmm. All Appaloosa does is it gains 800 attack for each material when it's that, that was used for its summon. You can note down its attack. You are allowed to write that down on your, your life pad, but you cannot put counters on it. And as to... So, uh, other mandatory effects of sorts like that. I suppose that applies in the same context of multi-roll. Correct. You cannot use you cannot use anything uh, to keep track of uh, multi-roll. You cannot put a counter. It doesn't gain a counter because multi-roll is an optional effect. You also cannot take a written note like you could with the Appaloosa. So. Anything else uh, that comes to mind in well, with regards to this topic I, at all before we move yeah. on? Yeah. I just want to say that Konami gets a really bad rep for this policy in particular with note taking, especially when you compare it to other games that just allow it. And I want to make the call out that believe it or not, Konami is all on your side. There is a lot more that goes into Yu-Gi-Oh than just Konami. Uh, people have to remember that Konami licenses the intellectual property from other entities. Um, and there's kind of a lot of approval and a lot of other companies that get to make decisions about the game that honestly don't even have any idea anything about the game, but because it has to do with the intellectual property, they, they get to have a say. And so there are some things that will get rejected due to the way that it could present an image to the brand for whatever reason. I'm not privy to those private discussions and I can't give you specific examples examples but i can tell you that believe it or not konami is actively trying to find ways to change things for the better for players but there is a lot of red tape that they themselves have to go through and you know firewall dragon um. <laughs> i mean uh i i disagree i think players should cry about it you're not allowed to track multi-roll it's an optional effect Appaloza doesn't gain counters Remember your cards. You can't just write down things like to just m remember like these kind of things. Like cry about it. Like you know, if you forget, you forget. Like be good at the game. <laughs> <laughs> Get good. There, there's a legitimate reason to allow note taking. Um, and and it it prevents you know he said she said yeah like mandatory like effects that, that yeah would break the game right like. I can't think of and an example right now, like some sort of lingering effect, maybe, I guess. You I, I would I would argue that the multi-role kind of falls under that, even though by policy it doesn't. And and that's what that's the point that I'm making, that, that Konami is aware, aware that there are gaps in what note-taking is allowed and what note-taking isn't. And they're actively trying to improve things for players, but it's not a quick process and it's not one that they have complete control over is all I was trying to say. Let's get into... I, I can you guess what the final section is going to be about with regards to policy? End of match. End of match procedures. Yes, this is I'll what I'm very passionate I'll just, I'll just about. Just talk. It. Like I, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious where you initially want to go with this. So I'll give my personal opinion on it. I, I have no qualms sharing so it. I've, thing, I've shared the thing it before. Is, though, w before you go on, I don't think like whatever whether people think it's good or bad it's, it's neither here or there right we don't that's not relevant we're not talking about that we're talking about like what can you do what can't you do how does it function right like sure in the in, like we're looking at it from a mechanical perspective right the whether you think it's bad or not is that that's not part of the discussion i 100 percent respect that line of thought but i also do want to call out that it, it is fair for people to sh share their opinion on, on that and that feedback is how things eventually change, that feedback gets shared. There's a right way to share that feedback and there's a wrong way to share that feedback. And um, I do think that a lot of the player base goes about it the wrong way. Um, but I think that you know, you're know you in a unique position where I think that you could share your opinion in the correct way um, and kind of show people how to share their opinion on it as well uh, to kind of push forward with that change. There is a lot of misconception um, and that leads to a lot of frustration. If you are unsure about policy or or what's going on, just call a judge. Oh, biggest part, guys, it's a really underutilized tool that players have, appeal. You're not being disrespectful by appealing a judge. You're making sure that you're getting a second opinion and that you're getting a second opinion from someone who has the level of experience that myself or other head judges have. There's nothing wrong with appealing as long as you do it the right way, and that is to let the judge give their ruling, and if you disagree with it, just let them know politely, I would like to appeal that ruling. So many times I've seen event reports come out with, this happened to me in end of match, the judge ruled this, and I read that and I'm like, 
that doesn't sound like how I would rule. And I was the head judge for the event, so I'll, I'll ask. And the players will be like, oh, well, we didn't appeal. I just thought that once the judge gave it, that that's how it was. So absolutely, you guys have the right to an appeal. We remind you at the beginning of every event, use the appeal. Don't feel bad. Don't feel like you're being that guy. As long as you're being respectful about it, it is a tool that's there to protect your tournament experience. Because once again, to reiterate, we are customer service. We are there for you guys. I want to start off uh, very basic. I side deck a copy of Red Resonator or Gaga Ga Cowboy. And I specifically play that with the intention to cause a life point manipulation in time. That is legal. Is that correct? Sure. That is legal. Now, moving on from that, getting into, I suppose, more complicated territories. Now, if I play those cards with the intention of winning a game through life point manipulation, I won game one, I lost game two. Um, and I'm, I'm losing game two, rather. Now, I'm in a situation where I know I cannot win. I can I cannot lose for a duration. Right? I can float my cards. I can, uh, you know, uh, resolve Seer Dante loop just constantly so my opponent can't really finish me off. And the purpose of that is so that the time on the, on the match runs out faster. Because that way, I know that if I get to game three and I play in my main phase for long enough, I can resolve a bar bar, for example. Would you say that is, provided that I'm play, playing at a reasonable pace, I'm just not scooping a game that I know is unwinnable. Would you say that's legal? That is legal by policy. Um, as long as your actions are progressing at a reasonable pace, you're not taking, intentionally taking additional time per action while resolving those, but you have legal actions. The Seer Dante loop is a perfect example of that. You know, as long as you're you sent the your Seer and your Dante, and you're not staring at your graveyard for a while, and then being like, mm, Seer, actually Dante 1, Seer 2. As long as you're not being like that, and you're just like, okay, uh, Seer chain link 1, Dante chain link 2, and you're, you're just progressing at a normal pace, that is legal. But, and there's a huge asterisk on here that I'm going to put out here as a deterrent to people who will try and find a way to take this and manipulate it. If the judge feels that there might be slow play, or the head judge feels that there might be something else going on. They can do anything from issuing Before a time you extension. Continue, what do you mean by going on here in this context? Because context? I think that's so, really important. Because sure. like I said, my intention is very clear. I yes. want the clock to run down so that I can perform life point manipulation in game three. There's a okay. difference between manipulating the clock and not scooping. The problem with this situation, and it's it's really funny that you bring this one up because this is a situation that I actually personally started a dialogue between myself and Konami. I'm not going to get into the specifics of that discussion um, and what they said. It's something that is on the radar. You know, again, there's, <laughs> we'll call it a loophole for lack of a better term to almost anything. And people trying to find the loopholes are going to find the loopholes no matter what the policy is. And in this case, there are people who will take what you described a step further and think of the, the, the example that I gave, you know, I'll do Seer Chainlink. Mm, actually, I'll do Dante Chain. Mm, uh, Seer one, Dante two, you know, something like that, where their, their intent isn't to not scoop and to win up in life, but their intent is to manipulate the oh. clock. It is a very tough thing as a judge to determine whether someone is intentionally manipulating the clock or not. Head judges can, at their discretion, issue a time extension. So if I feel that there might be Without something- Without issuing a penalty. Right? Correct. Without issuing a penalty. So okay. if I if I feel that there's something going on, but I'm not 100% certain, and I think that doing an investigation and disqualifying might be a bit extreme, I can issue a time extension to kind of give back what I feel was potentially lost. And if the behavior continues, then I can take a look at further and I can build that pattern. How exactly would you communicate that to a player as a judge? Would you say like, you know, the player starts kicking off and be like, why are you giving a time extension, blah, 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 blah. You know, I would, I guess, I would probably word that as saying something like, um, I don't feel what you're doing warrants slow play. However, I believe that time has been lost due to, I guess, just a lower pace of the game. And therefore, I'm, a, I'm, I'm issuing a two minute time extension. I mean, I don't know how you would like word that sort of in, a, in an official professional capacity. It, it really depends on the situation and who you're speaking to and kind of the the um, intensity of both of the players. There are some players that you can take a lighter tone with. And in general, when I can take the lighter tone, I attempt to take the lighter tone. That is 
always preferable, but there are other situations where you kind of have to be a little authoritative and those aren't enjoyable situations, but they happen. So it, I, I won't say that there's a set way. I will say that the way that you explained it would be my attempt and, and go to, um, that's the lighthearted, like, here's, uh, here's what it is. Let's, uh, let's do our best to understand why we're doing this. And, uh, if they start to fight it, then one of my go to, to end the discussion kind of, um, and that, that sounds a lot more harsh than it is. It's not that it's end the discussion, but if I let myself get drawn into a debate with every player as a head judge, I have to give you back that time in a time extension. So the longer I sit there discussing with you, my decision, um, the longer the tournament as a whole is going to go. And you know, the 1500 other players that are at the event are going to start getting pissed all because I'm sitting here having a one-on-one -on -one discussion with you. So what I end up doing is I tell them, listen, I've made my decision. If you wish to discuss it with me further, I'd be more than happy to, after your match, you can find me up at the stage. I wanted to ask another question with regard to end of match. And, um, I feel like I've had different answers on this now. Uh, let's say, uh, it's the middle of a game and time is running down on the clock. Uh, I'm ahead in life, provided that I play at a fast pace and provided that I'm playing at a, you know, at a reasonable pace. I'm not slow playing. I'm not uh, graveyard. Can I see uh, thinking if I'm at a fast and reasonable, not even fast, just a, a good reasonable pace. Am I allowed to do what is quote unquote useless plays for time to run out? What I mean by that, for example, is I am I'm playing a combo deck that just has like so many different like extra deck monsters that can spam. It can special summon lots. So useless play would be like, I'm going to synchro summon. And then I'm going to link that into a link two. Then I'm going to climb up into a unicorn. And then I'm going to climb up into an access code. And then I'm going to put another monster on the field. I'm going to combine that access code and my other monster into Nightmare Phoenix. Then I'm going to combine another monster into Nightmare Unicorn and spin itself back into the extra deck. So these are useless plays that don't do anything in the, in the context of competitive play. But in the context of the time, it's running down the clock and time is called and I won because I've been just sitting there spam link summoning uselessly. So this was another situation that I brought up in that dialogue I opened uh, that I mentioned. The best response I got that really kind of knocked me down to reality because I, I am of my personal opinion, <clears throat> this is entirely my personal opinion that that should not be legal. And the response I got was, you know, you're probably right, but how do you enforce that? That's how exactly does, what I was going to say. Where do you draw the does, line between yeah. judging that a player is doing something bad or like bad in the context of this is a terrible play to you're running down the clock? Where's the line drawn? Exactly. It's it, it, it's not it's not just doing a terrible play and running down the, the, the time clock, right? It's going to go a step further. How does the judge know that's a terrible play and not the genius level play if they're not a familiar with the deck that's being played or the intent or, or what's in what card you might have in your hand that you're trying to to get off there's some things that are more obvious than others obviously and a judge such as myself that has a player background would i be able to identify that absolutely but you can't rely on every judge in the program to be able to look at that situation and say yeah that's a horrible move what is he doing versus oh is he actually just big braining us right now and so it, it becomes really difficult it's a loophole for sure and it's a loophole that they're actively trying to close um but they're trying to think of the best way to close it before they close it because enforcement is a nightmare but i will say rewinding to our previous conversation that is an example where i as a head judge can go you know what i feel that there have a lot there have been a lot of actions taken that did not progress the game state so i'm going to go ahead and give you guys an extension for the time i feel is lost and i can issue a time extension at my discretion for these so-called useless plays you would probably want you would probably do that um i i'm not going to say a blanket yes or no i would do that but it's it's something that can happen if the situation i feel calls for it this is news to me by the way i had no i had no clue about this uh you know, sort of time extension without penalty kind of thing. I thought these these only ever happened if there was, you know, prolonged periods of time for ruling questions or if penalties were taking place. Yeah, time extensions are a useful tool. We, we try and use them sparingly because they do prolong the event as a whole. And, you know, you don't want to hold up, again, 1,500 players for two. But time extensions have their purpose in, in a lot of different things. And they are, like I said, just a, a useful tool to help resolve situations. A final example that I wanted to uh, ask about as well. Um, so I'm curious as to people who sort of, uh, you know, da 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 boo 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 boo, uh, battle phase attack, right? Um, after like a whirlwind of plays and stuff. So my question is, if my opponent has game on board or they're just about to uh, put game on board and they're speeding through their combo and they go bang battle phase, 
there's like literally five seconds on the clock. They go battle phase. And I say, hang on, thinking. Um, I activate the effect of, shall we say, Thunder Dragon Dark in my hand. I discard it. I add Thunder Dragon uh, Dark from my deck to my hand. Already that probably takes like 10 seconds in and of itself. Uh, I shuffle my deck. I cut. I put it down. Oh, time on the round. I did this in the main phase. I am wondering how would... What, what do you think of that situation? So I'm going to answer that situation as literal as you told it, because a lot of these situations are 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 really read the situation and what's going on. Um, so the answer that I'm going to give right now only applies to what you literally just said. And in this situation, I would say that we're in the battle phase. I've had a lot of conversations when the rules changed in 2018 um, surrounding the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. Spirit of the law isn't to just end the game right then and there, right then and there. It's to bring the game to an expedient close as close to the result as it would have been. And that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to let everybody go into battle phase. That doesn't necessarily mean that the result would have been the person who went into battle phase if they're only doing 1700 attack. But as long as your intent to move to battle phase was declared prior to to, to time being called, um, I think it was very clear if you had an action as the opponent that changed the game significantly, such as if you flipped up needle ceiling and destroyed monsters, or if you, not even that, if you regeki breaked and destroyed a single monster, I would say that we're in the main phase. But all you did was resolve a search effect. You didn't really change the game state. It didn't have a major impact. If there was a Thunder Dragon Titan on board and you responded and you know popped a card, maybe we're still in the main phase. But because the game state didn't change massively, my intent to move to battle phase was declared. And so we're moving to battle phase. Um, so it's basically just in sense you you're you're essentially using I'm not sure if you can really say it's dangerous, Tori, but you're just essentially using your player knowledge to decipher whether or not a play is logical per se and whether or not that should impact the entering of the battle phase is what you think i don't i don't think that i would go that far i think that there are some very basic did this impact the game state things that that you can tell as a judge whether you have player experience or not it comes down to did the game state change significantly and in your example you discarded thunder dragon dark to add a copy of thunder dragon dark to hand um, the only thing that changed is now there's an extra Thunder Dragon Dark in your graveyard. The, the game state didn't really change significantly. Um, in my example, a monster left the field. So the game state kind of changed significantly because um, that changes a lot of things from the amount of damage to the types of cards that could be activated when an attack is declared because it's now less monsters, um, things like that. So uh, at that point, it, it had a significant impact um, and the phase progression wouldn't necessarily continue. I'm just I'm just worried that if judges use game knowledge as a barometer for rulings, that can maybe be murky territory for the reasons we discussed earlier. Like for example, you know, trying to understand if a play was big brain or if they are just winding down time, for example, right? I think that there are policies that are written that expect that a floor judge will need assistance from a lead or a head judge um, to answer some of these. Uh, because they're not clear cut, they're not easy to get, and you do need a lot of experience to answer these kind of questions. Um, and that's why there are checks at events like regionals, at YCSs, um, at things like that. And then this circles back to when you're judging, relying on your strengths and your weaknesses as a team. Just because assistant head judge A is the person to handle the appeal doesn't mean that they're going to handle it in a silo. They're going to talk to assistant head judge B and to the head judge, and they're going to say, hey, what do you guys think on this? Let's get, get our heads together. Um, and they're going to go to, if there's one judge that has more player knowledge than the others, they're going to get their opinion. Hey, did this significantly change the game state? That's why there's the appeals process. Um, it's so that you get that second opinion and you get that that opinion from experience. If you are in that situation and, and the judge makes the ruling and you're unsure of it, just appeal. I'm going to say something that there are people who will hate me for saying it, but I used to tell my friends that typically if something wasn't in your favor and you're not a rulings expert, just appeal, right? Because you don't know that that's how it was supposed to go. And that's what the appeal is for, is the second opinion. Please don't actually do that. That's going to really slow down a tournament if everyone appeals everything. But the spirit behind that is that you need to be the one who takes control of your tournament experience in that situation. Um, and if you feel that the call was not correct for any reason, 
even if you're 90% sure that it could be correct, if there's that 10% of you that's like, man, I, I really think that this might have been wrong, just appeal. One final point I wanted to, I know I've taken up a lot of your time here, but this has been just such an interesting discussion. Um, I would uh, like to wrap up with a final point. Um, I just wanted to ask, so something that I find always very bizarre to me is people play differently uh, from minute one of the duel to minute 39. Um, it very much confuses me how people are more chill and relaxed at minute one, but suddenly at minute 39, all kinds of protocol are thrown out the window. Um, people will pick up their deck, uh, add a card, throw it into the grave. Uh, you know, just cards just start flying around, right? Literally, like, the deck is, like, in half, like, on the middle of the field as they're, like, turboing through a combo. I'm wondering, you know, so we've talked about, like, I suppose more of the receiving end of slow play, um, but in terms of, like, someone who is trying to get through their turn as quickly as possible. What is like the protocol in place for how you play when you are just actually just turbo speeding through combos? So the, the reality of the situation is that at the start of the match, you don't think that you're going to go into time. That's not what's on everyone's mind. Everyone is sitting down and they're like, all right, I want I want to 2-0 this person. Um, so it's it, they play methodically. They play as cool as possible. They try and retain their uh composure and they they think a little bit more about their plays and then as they realize that it's not going to be as super easy as they thought it was going to be you know the clock starts winding down and they they see oh crap there's a real possibility that i go into time they don't want that and they start rushing it's a fine line it's not something that's easy to deal with um there is a such thing as fast play which is not allowed you need to play at a reasonable pace whoa, reasonable whoa, whoa, pace. Whoa, hold on hold on hold on whoa yep. say that again what did what, what was that term there is a such thing as fast play. Is that really is, a thing? It's it's you know it's not an official term, um, but okay. it's where you're playing you're playing too fast to uh, actively communicate the things that are occurring and the actions that you're taking. If you are going too fast for me to understand what's going on and respond to your actions, that's just as bad as if you're taking too long to make an action, and that can result in a warning for a procedural error minor. Yes, I understand the need. I would say that if you are afraid of time, you should probably play that fast from the start of the round. I, I understand that there, there are some situations that require more thought than others. I wouldn't advise you to just suddenly rapidly speed up your play um, because that, that can introduce a whole other can of worms. I'm going to ask you uh, another uh, extremely dis difficult question here, but uh, <laughs> where do you draw that line? There's not... A specific answer I could give you to that. That's another case by case basis. You're going to take a look at what's going on and um, evaluate the situation as best you can and make a decision based on the information that you had. Um, and I, I think like that a, a good example. Player... Go ahead. Sorry. I, I, I feel like a good example is, you know, a, a player uh, activating a pot of desires, banishing 10 off the top, drawing two, putting the desires to the grave all without like asking for a response or doing anything and then instantly plays down a normal summon monster they're like well i i had ash for your desires dude so what 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 do you think could go down, go on there that's i feel in, like in, that's a very clear warning right in 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 that situation it depends on if the the cards drawn were shuffled into the hand or not um if they're shuffled in it goes back to our beginning discussion that's irreparable um because i don't know what the cards are that you just drew uh mm. and you weren't supposed to draw them but if they were uh if they were drawn um and they weren't shuffled in then you have to reveal them to me and you have to put them back on top of your deck and you will get a warning and i think one of the one of the biggest things that i want to say I, I think this is actually a perfect segue if i can um sure. can i talk about building a pattern Go the ahead. biggest question the biggest question that i get from people who don't understand judging to me as a judge is how do you tell when someone's doing something intentionally malicious versus an honest mistake. And the answer that I always give them is, is it's a lot harder than people think, but it's a lot easier when players aren't afraid and they um, raise their hand and they call for a judge in those situations. But there's a lot of times where a player might do something like, what's a good example? Oh, they activate desires under Lancia, right? They banish the 10, they go and the opponent's like, oh, you can't do that. 
and they're like, oh, you're right. And they put the 10 back on top of the deck and the opponent's like, yeah, that's that's not a problem. And they just continue play from there. That hap Stuff like that happens all the time. I really wish that everyone would call a judge when that happens. I know that no one wants to be confrontational. No one wants to be that guy. And there's a way to do it without being confrontational. But if you don't call the judge, then we don't have a record of it happening. And if it does, if we don't have a record, then when we go to handle that same situation with this player in the next, um, when, when we go to handle that situation with the player in the next round, and they're doing that same exact thing, we have no idea that they did it. So now uh, we come over and that person's just going to get a warning because this player did call a judge because we have no idea that it happened in the round before. But if we can start building a pattern that, hey, you know, this person's done this almost every round, we can kind of realize, and, and the tournament software keeps track of this. When we put in a penalty, it gets put in the software. And whenever a judge should always ask you at an event, have you received the penalty for this infraction yet this event? And when you answer no, the first thing we do is we go look at all your penalties for the event and we see what has happened this event. And then the head judges or assistant head judges will determine if they need to step in and handle the situation or if they need to, or, or if it's okay and they can let the, the floor judge and the lead handle it. When players don't call judge because they're trying to be the nice guy, all they're doing is hurting another player in a future round because this person could be doing it maliciously. But when it's just one time happening, it's very hard to determine that it's malicious. So if we don't have that pattern built that we can look at, we, we can't we can't do anything about it in the later rounds because we don't know that it happened. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So um, in summary, you know, you have to build that pattern from players who are uh, doing things um, either intentionally or unintentionally to make sure that they understand how their cards work. And if it's a repeated pattern, then it has to be officially documented, basically. Uh, going back to a little bit about the fast play thing. Um, and I understand, like, of course, you can't have a hard, and fa uh, a hard uh, line and black and white set in stone. What is or isn't? you know, playing too fast. Um, but I think one thing that players unanimously agree upon is very typically it's like, oh, no hand traps, go off, right? And players speed through their combo and it's become sort of, I guess, accustomed among a lot of players, I feel, to just not shuffle their deck until the end of their combo or, in, or in, until the end of the turn. Um, and I'm just wondering what you think about that situation. So the first thing to note about that is that situation technically is illegal from the player who said no hand traps. They put in policy that you cannot reveal private information. People don't understand the line between bluffing and lying. And so a lot of people would overtly lie and say that they were bluffing. To prevent that, you're just not allowed to say anything about your private information. And that in and of itself is procedural error minor. If I reword that so it doesn't go into a different subject. However, we can talk about that more if you'd like to after. Um, sticking with the original question, if I was to just say, you know, go on, play. Answer, answering the question again, uh, I just got to re <laughs> regain my train of thought. So in that situation, right, where you're saying go on, you're, you're not you're not shuffling the deck until the end. Let's talk about that specifically. That mm -hmm. is something that we allow at events, um, but it's not that it's until the end. And we've actually, we started using these cards on live stream and at Worlds and stuff on those streams to kind of illustrate that to people um, and you're supposed to turn it over to red if the deck has been searched but not shuffled um, and then green if the, the deck is shuffled and good to draw from um, and so what you do is you just you can search and keep going but whenever you need to draw you just shuffle right then when you're about to draw that's fine that's an accepted shortcut there's nothing wrong with that go ahead and do that saying go on is a little more vague i as your opponent would still ask you for a response to everything i did I, that doesn't mean wait there and pause and, and wait but i would just say you know i would call out my actions and that's just me because of my experience because i don't want to get in a situation where then my opponent who said go on is like well he didn't ask me for a response to this thing i said go on when he normal summoned moye not when he synchro summoned chi chow mm -hmm. you know yeah so, uh, you know to very bottom line you can't explicitly divulge information if you want to tell your opponent to play you can tell them to go on no response but in the context of play your full turn i have no hand traps that's definitely something you should uh, avoid correct so i i saw a couple questions about the the difference between a bluff and a lie oh um, that's that's perfect yep go on yeah so i i think that the the best example from there is um an example of a lie would be if I have mirror force set and you go to battle phase and I'm like, oh yeah, go ahead. I don't have anything. 
and then you attack, and I'm like, haha, mirror force. Um, and uh, that's a straight up lie. That information in and of itself is probably quite surprising to a lot of people. In Yu Gi Oh!, you can't say, um, you know, better not attack me. I might have a mirror force set, right? That's you can't do that. Isn't that correct? Yeah, that that's that's something you cannot do. Um, okay. but what you can do is in that same situation is um oh you're gonna enter battle phase sure i might not have anything you know that's that's a real non-committal answer it's 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 still kind of on that line there but i i'm not lying i, I might not have anything i happen to have something um and so it's it's all about how you phrase things this is the biggest piece of advice i'm going to give you guys <laughs> If you get caught doing something that you shouldn't do, don't try and lie your way out of it because that's only going to make it worse, especially because that just comes across as disrespectful. So if you're doing something and you're truly remorseful for it, I'm going to be a little more lenient when I'm writing my statement. I'm going to tell Konami, you know, the player felt uh, I got a genuine vibe from the player that they understood what they did was wrong and that they shouldn't do it and they're not going to do it again. But if you lie to me and say, I'm going to tell them he tried to lie to me, this person clearly knew what they were doing and they tried to lie their way out of it and they, they're they going to do it again, basically. Um, just, just be honest with us. Like, show us, we try and show you guys respect. We don't like disqualifying players. So yeah, in that instance, you, you can't, you can't lie about things you have or cards you have and things like that. So um, the next point I think that is really, really popular is, hmm, how many summons is that? Um, Yeah, go on. I don't actually have Nibiru in my hand, by the way. So that is perfectly that? legal. Uh, oh. That is that is perfectly legal. You're asking for game state information. Um, you're not saying explicitly that you have a Nibiru. Okay, you're so not committing. When you, but when you, but I feel like how many summons is like such, such an, ex, an a, 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 it carries such a massive implication with it when someone asks sure. you how many summons, right? There's but you're no not, other... you're not, you're not revealing any private information and you're not lying. You didn't say you have Nibiru. If you say you have Nibiru, that's a lie because you don't have the Nibiru. If you say you don't have Nibiru and you and you have it, that's a lie because it contradicts reality. That's not that's not what it is. But in this situation, you're not committing to one way or, or the other on the fence. You are asking a question about the game state. That question tends to make people think a certain way. That's not your fault that their mind took them to that way. That is a bluff. That is a bluff. That is not a lie. Do you think that maybe, because um, it's really interesting, you mentioned this quite heavily earlier when we're talking about the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law, right? So in that mm -hmm. scenario, you are technically not breaking any rules, of course. But in the spirit of that question, what you are doing is, I think, right? Like it's, it's it means I, something when you ask that. Do, do you do you agree? I I disagree i think that this i well okay so i agree with you but i disagree with the interpretation of what the spirit of the law is i think this you're in you're interpreting the spirit of this law to be that you're not allowed to mislead your opponent that is not the spirit of the law the spirit of the law is pretty explicitly you're not allowed to lie you know, you you cannot lie. You 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 cannot reveal private information. If you reveal private information, you at least have to be truthful about it. You cannot lie or misrepresent the game state. Is it very likely that you're trying to make me think that you have Nibiru? Absolutely, but that's not you didn't lie to me. Um, I mean, I have my own opinion of that, but if that's how policy is, then you know you don't have any right other than to respect it, of course. So that's fair. Um, I I have another question, uh, actually. And it's about uh, public knowledge and what is sure. considered public knowledge. Um, Cards on the field that are facing up, their effects and anything that is applying to them is always public knowledge. It's mm. when a card goes to a private knowledge location that it's no longer public knowledge. So in that case, you know, I activate reinforcement of the army. I add DD Warrior Lady to my hand. I reveal it to you that it's DD Warrior Lady. I add it to my hand and then I shuffle my hand. And then a second later, you ask me, what did you add off of reinforcement again? I'm not obligated to respond. Now, a lot of people will respond out of courtesy, especially if it was asked that quickly. But once it's in the hand, it's, pri it's private knowledge. It's no longer there. It's interesting you bring that because this is a very common thing that players will do. And I feel like 
for the most part, it's almost gentleman's agreement where, you know, you play out and then like, you know, your opponent does a combo and they come to the end of the turn and they say, um, oh, so what do I know in your hand, right? And they'll be like, oh, well, I searched this and I set that. That's not mm -hmm. technically information you're entitled to anymore at that point, correct? Correct. However, people will share that information with each other out of common courtesy. Absolutely. Is that wrong? Is, is that not necessarily incorrect? Technically. Because that's te divulging te private information. Te that's stage technically, it, it is against policy to reveal it, but you would be hard pressed to find someone to penalize that particular application of revealing private knowledge um, because you are confirming something. But yes, the, it is. I, I, I see chat going crazy. I do want to make sure that they understand the distinction. You have to reveal it when you search it. I, what I'm saying is I search the DD Warrior Lady. I've shown him my, the DD Warrior Lady and I add it to my hand. The instant it's added to my hand, I no longer have to answer, oh, I searched DD Warrior Lady when he asks me what I searched. Yeah, because it is now considered private. And um, I guess that is I, the intention there, I suppose, is that that's the skill of the game to an extent. You're supposed to remember the cards your opponent has searched. You're supposed to like keep track of these things. And so yep. you shouldn't be at any point in the duel con consistently privy to that to that knowledge, right? It's 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 simply because once it's in the hand, it's it's in a private knowledge location. It's no longer considered public knowledge. Uh, this is a, a good question that someone asked, though. But if they asked you, did you search DD Warrior Lady afterwards? They can't lie about that, right? Or they can't lie, but they're not obligated to answer. They, but sorry, they don't have to say yes, they did, but they cannot say no, they did not. And I completely get it. Again, from the player's side, is that you'd be hard pressed to find someone who tells you no. I'm not going to tell you what what I just added because it's it's just common courtesy. Like it's it's very kind of rude to just do that to someone especially when it's in the moment like some people process information differently and understanding that you know you literally just did the action that's fine just answer the question a lot of policy believe it or not i, I know that people will will find it frustrating to accept this but a lot of policy is written because someone has put people in that situation where it has to be addressed in that policy and you have to say this has to be this way because otherwise we've already seen what happens when it gets abused otherwise all right uh mr bovarnik this has been a extremely fruitful uh discussion i really didn't think this would be such an overwhelmingly popular segment but um you have been an absolute treat to have here uh your eloquence and your um ability to go in depth with these questions have been unparalleled in terms of judging from what i've seen so it's been a you know a real pleasure to have you here so please chat give them lots of love it's it's been great being here this was a really i i love sharing this information uh with other people so any opportunity to do so i'm happy to do so yeah no I, and anytime you want to you want to jump on or talk about something I'm, I'm more than happy to uh to welcome you anytime so just let me know um Sounds is there good. anything you want to round off with or talk about really quick uh, as a um, end point or do you want to just go straight to shout outs or plugs or anything um no i i just want to want to re reiterate to guy to the chat if you're in a situation you're unsure appeal you know i know i've said it a, a hundred times already today but it's it's the most important tool that you have as a player to make your tournament experience good um and also try and remember we all get heated if something doesn't go the right way to you Remember that judges are human and they have stuff going on too and people can make mistakes. A lot of the time, if you try and discuss it politely with the judge afterwards, they'll apologize. And I know that that doesn't necessarily make the situation better if a ruling was mishandled, but just be aware that while you're sitting there playing for 12 plus hours, they're on their feet for 12 plus hours answering all these questions. And sometimes things get missed. Um, no, th those of you that, that do have my social, uh, feel free to share it if you want. And if just try and keep the questions to a, to a minimum. Um, but if you really are, you're coming up on an event and keep in mind that I do sleep and work too. So yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Glad to have you here and, uh, I will, uh, see you hopefully in the near future. Take care. Likewise. Bye.